Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, words taken from the gospel today for low Sunday, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen. And there are many reasons for his majesty's resurrection, reasons why he rose from the dead. St. Thomas and the scholastics give many, many reasons, but among them are God's justice and his mercy. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that the resurrection is for the commendation of divine justice, to which it belongs to exalt them who humble themselves for God's sake. Justice, therefore, is a reason for the resurrection, where justice is giving to another what they deserve, what is rightfully theirs, what has been earned in some way or other. Our Lord humbled himself, even unto death, death on the cross. He was totally and utterly innocent, free of all sin and stain. And yet, he was unjustly put to death in a cruel way. And so, he justly deserved to be raised up again. And since his humiliation was unto the depths, his resurrection is unto the heights of the heaven of heavens. Okay, justice, reason for the resurrection. Mercy is now connected to justice since mercy goes beyond justice by giving more, more than what is rightfully due to another. Thus, St. Thomas explains that mercy presupposes justice or builds upon justice to become, as it were, the superabundant fulfillment of justice. So mercy is going the extra mile, in other words, one way of thinking about it. So recall, for example, how Abraham was commanded by God, the creator and sustainer of all life. He was commanded by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. As the creator and sustainer of life, he can make that command. And he did. Abraham fulfilled justice by fearing God and obeying his command to sacrifice Isaac. His only son by Sarah. Yet, having fulfilled justice, God granted Abraham mercy. Not only was he given back his son Isaac alive as a type and a prophecy of the future resurrection of Christ, but also he was granted a vision of the Christ on Calvary with the replacement sacrifice, the ram caught in the tree on Mount Moriah. His majesty indicated this to the Jews, chapter 8 of John. He said, Abraham rejoiced that he might see my day. He saw it and was glad. So Abraham saw Calvary. Remember, in his mind, he'd already killed his son Isaac. And lo and behold, he gets Isaac back. Sign of the resurrection. So Abraham was granted many blessings besides this, many mercies. Thus we read in Genesis, Because thou hast done this thing, and hast not spared thine only begotten Son for my sake, I will bless thee, and I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is by the seashore. Thy seed shall possess the gates of their enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Consequently, Abraham is called our father in faith. We'll mention him today in the Holy Mass, and he'll be mentioned until the end of time. And we still invoke his name. Isn't that wonderful? Thus, the scriptures say of God, his mercies endure forever. The Council of Trent says, if we contrite and penitent with sincere heart and upright faith, with fear and reverence, in other words, we fulfill justice toward God. We draw nigh to God under this justice. We obtain mercy, it says, and find grace and seasonable aid. So Abraham fulfilled justice and he was given mercy. You see? This is a very important point of God's divine plan because it shows that he grants his mercy in abundance to those who seek to fulfill his justice. You seem to forget that today. Hmm. We all want his mercy, 
But how can we obtain it if we forget his justice? The scriptures state over and over and over again that God grants mercy to those who fear him. That is, those who are willing to fulfill their justice toward him. Some examples, King David says in a number of ways in the Psalms, but the mercy of the Lord is from eternity and unto eternity upon them that fear him. And when you fear somebody, you want to do exactly what he tells you to do. You're going to do whatever he wants because you're afraid of him. You can have a good fear and you can have a servile fear. It doesn't matter. You still want to do what he says. That's justice. Our lady said in her Magnificat, his mercy is from generation unto generations to them that fear him. Again, those who fear God seek to fulfill all justice. As his majesty said so plainly in the Sermon on the Mount, seek ye therefore first the kingdom of God and his justice and all these things, that is mercies, shall be added unto you. Now this brings us to another aspect of God's mercy. As we heard a moment ago, mercy is about going the extra mile, giving more than is deserved. But divine mercy also removes obstacles, removes obstacles. It relieves misery by removing defects and evils. This is why we poor humans want it so badly. It removes evils that we cannot overcome. Disease, for example, severe temptations, divisions, even death itself. As we see with Lazarus and many other saints that have Raise people up from the dead. Amazing. All God's mercy removes evils. Now, even though all that God does in the world has mercy as its foundation, because he doesn't owe us anything by justice. So everything is mercy on his part. But once we're in the world, once we're in the plan of God, his economy of salvation, we must begin by seeking to give to God and to others what is their due. That's what all the saints did. And then God assists us with his mercy. Once again, as St. Thomas explains, mercy presupposes justice or builds upon it. Now, we fulfill justice by obeying God's commands. What are his commands? We're baptized. That was a big command. Go out into all the world and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and teach them all that I've taught you, and to obey my commands. So we're baptized. We confess our sins. The church orders us to do that at least once a year. We learn our faith. And then God is merciful beyond measure by removing our guilt, lessening our debt of punishment, even removing faults in due time. If we work at it, all of a sudden God comes along, honors our goodwill and our reverence, and removes that fault. It happens for those who stay faithful. He gives us himself in Holy Communion. What a great mercy that is. And finally, he gives us his blessed mother as our intercessor. These are mercies. We know that the floodgates of this divine mercy that removes evils opened up upon the world after the passion, death, and resurrection of his majesty. Man is a sinner and has a debt that he cannot pay. He is the man in the gospel with a debt of 10,000 talents. That's an unpayable debt. The God-man comes and takes the guilt and debt upon himself, and then mercy is bestowed on those who submit themselves to him through baptism and enter in to his mystical body, the church. Now, given this is the way of things in God's plan, and it is, Notice that the more his majesty humbled himself, the more mercy God the Father granted him to give back to us fallen men. His majesty humbled himself in every way. And God granted him mercy to help us in every way. Thus, we see how divine mercy works. Good Friday was for atonement, just satisfaction of sins, reparation, transference of debt, and payment. It was total self-abasement. It was for the removal of blockages that could not be overlooked by God's justice. 
That's what Good Friday is. Whereas the resurrection is for granting of favors and mercies. Good Friday is for taking away the bad things. Easter Sunday is for granting the good things. The two are connected. They are inseparable. And by the way, Sunday, Easter Sunday is the Sunday of Sundays. It's the first Sunday on which all Sundays are based. And I'll say it out loud. I'm a little concerned about this divine mercy novena where you started on Good Friday and you just pass right on through Easter Sunday and act as if the big day is divine mercy Sunday. Sorry, folks, that's not right. Easter Sunday is the day. Not today. Today is an echo of that day. This is the big day. Easter Sunday. A story is told of a judge forced to pass judgment upon his son who killed a man. The just sentence was death. He's the judge. He has to judge correctly. The judge declared the sentence on his own son, but then throws off his robes and comes down, that is from heaven, and takes his convicted son's place, Adam, dying the death of a murderer. Justice preceded the act of mercy. First he can he gave the sentence, then he was merciful. This act takes care of our reconciliation with God. It's vertical justice is satisfied between God and man with Christ's death. But there's still a problem, isn't there? The problem is how to fulfill justice between the dead man and the murderer. The horizontal justice still needs to be satisfied to complete the sign of salvation, which is the cross. Thus, a resurrection is needed. The murdered man must rise so that justice can be satisfied. This is yet another reason for Christ's resurrection. He rises so that all can rise. Think about it. Those two are not reconciled yet. If there's a murderer and the dead man who's gone, how am I going to reconcile with this person? God makes it possible with his resurrection. All can be reconciled even with each other on the last day. Nothing of justice will be un left unanswered, unfulfilled. Even if one or more of the parties are damned in hell, everyone will be called to rise and meet with the Christ, the final judge at the final judgment to resolve all injustices. Now, this brings us to the justice of eternal hell. Something that's been questioned recently, interestingly, we should address this to make sure it's clear in our mind. Is such a place, such a punishment just? And is it merciful? That's a good question. And it's been answered by the saints and by the church. So when someone is converting on their deathbed, among other things, they need to believe explicitly that God is one in three persons. So if I'm there and I want him to be converted and become Catholic and die a Catholic, I have to make sure he believes that God is one in three persons. I have to make sure he believes that his divine son became man and died for our sins. And I also have to make sure that he understands God rewards the good and punishes the bad. That's required. We have to believe that. God punishes the bad. That the wicked will be punished after death is acknowledged by all who maintain the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. God is holy and therefore he hates sin. Sin and holiness are directly opposed. He is just and therefore he claims satisfaction for the offenses committed against him. And he is wise and therefore requires punishment as a means of restoring the moral order of the universe. It's been torn apart. It must be restored. He is merciful as he does not punish as much as we deserve. So St. Thomas says that even though the souls in hell are burning for all eternity, they do not burn as much as they deserve. So there is mercy even in hell. Inasmuch as sin does not receive its due punishment in this world, it must do so in the other world, the theologians have pointed out. 
Hence, the tradition of all nations speak of some sort of hell. Everyone believes in a hell of some kind in the history of the world. Divine revelation, the Holy Church, and the universal agreement of the fathers and the doctors teach us that this hell is real, that it is forever, everlasting, eternal, and it is painful. And finally, it's just. It's just. Thus, the infallible Athanasian creed reads toward the end like this. In other words, folks, this is de fide. It is necessary to eternal salvation that he also believe faithfully the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose coming all men shall rise again with their bodies and shall give account for their own works, and that they that have done good shall go into life eternal, and they who indeed have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith, which except a man shall have believed faithfully and firmly, he cannot be in a state of salvation. Quotation, Athanasian Creed, De Fide Teaching of Holy Mother Church. St. Teresa of Jesus visited hell in a vision. She saw her place there prepared by the devils. She wrote in her life, I suddenly found that without knowing how I had seemingly been put in hell. I understood that the Lord wanted me to see the place the devils had prepared there for me and which I merited, I deserved justly because of my sins. I well understood that it was a great favor, a mercy, and that the Lord desired me to see with my own eyes the place his mercy had freed me from. Make no mistake, the devil has a place for each of us down there. And he's counting on getting us there. Only by God's mercy and us fulfilling his justice are we going to avoid going there. She literally experienced many of the pains offered to the residents of hell. Pains of the body and pains of the soul, such that she stated later, being burned here on earth is very little when compared to being burned by the fire that is there. She counted this experience of hell among the greatest favors the Lord had bestowed upon her. Now, do we want God's mercies to avoid this eternal punishment? He grants us mercy and abundance to those who fear him, dearly beloved, and those who seek to fulfill his justice. Here is how we can then seek to fulfill his justice. Let's end with this. Here we go. First, let us recognize that God is in charge. This is his universe. This is his world. He is God. He is king. This is why he gave us all the prophecies and the types of the Old Testament ahead of time to prove beyond any doubt that he is God. To let us know he is in charge and this is his plan. Thus, in justice, we give God what is his, this world and all that is in it. Abraham gave back to God Isaac because God said so. It's his world. We give back to him what belongs to him. Let us therefore stop clinging on to things as if they were our own. Rather than given to us to fulfill God's holy justice. Second of all, we should live by God's laws. For example, the Ten Commandments on the six precepts of the church. All that they entail, we live by them. Once again, he made us in justice. We live according to how he made us. This will bring God's mercy and many blessings. Third of all, we can make sure that Christ's fulfilling of divine justice on Good Friday was not in vain. By admitting that we are indeed sinners and need help and acknowledge our individual sins against his commandments to a priest and confession regularly. By doing this, we bring them to Christ who takes them and fulfills justice on the cross so that he can grant us an abundance of mercy to conquer that sin. Meanwhile, we strive to prevent the repetition of these sins. But let's not let that grace go in vain. Let's use it for good as it is meant to be. 
Finally, as we grow in following Christ more and more, we will want to do what he did. We will not be satisfied with trying to fulfill justice anymore, but we'll seek to alleviate the sufferings of the church and the world by taking some suffering upon ourselves to remove the bad things if we're able. The blockages so that God will grant his mercy upon the world. To prevent souls from going to hell, as Our Lady of Fatima asked. Such people will seek transference, vicarious suffering, that is, to make reparation. In a word, they will seek to die with Christ on the cross. Isaac let himself be bound. Isaac carried the wood of the cross to the top of the hill. So that they will rise with him and then God will be forced by his own self, by his own creation, his own promises to grant them many blessings and favors. This is what the saints all did. So as God fulfilled justice in Christ after his humble passion and does so with mercy and superabundance, so also will he do for all the suffering and injustice we undergo for him and with him, and in him. God's given you every chance, every day. You have sufferings. Start using them. Let us do these things, dearly beloved, and God will grant us his mercy, not only in abundance, but in superabundance at the proper time. And what is more, he will grant us a glorious resurrection with all the saints on the last day. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.